So here's what we're doing um, in this season uh, when it comes to the, the preaching. Here, typically, what we, typically what we're doing right, is we take a book of the Bible and we just walk through it passage by passage. And we got to John 15, because we've been working through John, and we got to this phrase, this teaching, this commandment of Jesus, love one another, and here's what love looks like, no greater love, there's no greater love than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends, and I wanted to just sit on it, I wanted to pause, I wanted to chew on it, and I wanted to ask questions about what does it mean to love that way, specifically, what does it mean to do that in the midst of conflict, because I think that's one of the hardest times that I, one of the ex- experiences where I have the hardest time loving people well, laying my life down for people. Can anybody relate to that? This is like conflict is such a regular part of our lives and it's a part of our lives where uh, our emotions uh, get fired up. We tend to lose self-control in conflict. I mean, uh, it, it, it can have devastating effects if we don't handle it rightly. Uh, I want to know how to love in general, yes, but let's just, let's just stare at the difficulty in the face. I want to know how to love in the midst of conflict because um, that's when I just think it's hardest. So we're, we're parking there. We're on the third part of a four-part series, a third sermon in a four-part series. We're taking it straight out of even the title of the series, Resolving Everyday Conflict, comes straight out of Ken Sandy. And uh, Kevin Johnson's book entitled "Resolving Everyday Conflict." Um, so that's what we're that's what what we're what we're doing. I, I kind of say that every week because somebody at some point is actually going to read the book, and they're going to say, "Oh, you kind of just preached right out of the book." And isn't that plagiarism? And the answer is no, because I'm citing my source, and I'm telling you, I'm preaching straight out of this book. So. Um, I'm not really saying anything new. Um, I just want you to know that. (laughs) I'm not making this stuff up. This isn't really expositional preaching. What we typically do is we take a passage, we unpack the passage line by line. This isn't really that. I'm taking a four-week break from that, and we're just talking about the topic of resolving conflict. And when it comes to resolving (laughs) everyday conflict... The resolution starts with the gospel. It, it doesn't start with something that you need to do. It doesn't start with some great plan to, of, of how to uh, uh, get your heart to change. It starts with what God has already done for you. What God has already done for us. The gospel is not something you do. The gospel is not something that you perform. The gospel is news. And what do you do with news? You share it. You hear it. You believe it. You don't do news. (laughs) You hear news. And you need to hear this morning that God has done things for you to help you be able to resolve conflict. The gospel pronounces a number of things, but one of the things that the gospel pronounces is that God has made you, if you're a Christian, if you are in Christ, you're a new creation. Uh, That means that a new work has launched inside of you, a new nature has launched inside of you. God the Holy Spirit himself dwells within you and has awakened you. It's as though you had no taste buds, And all your life, you've been tasting honey, trying to, and you're just like, it's just sticky. That's all I got. Sticky and it's golden. And then God says, new creation, taste buds. Whoa! That's what happens when you're born again. You see things that you never saw because a new nature has been awaken within you. And that new nature means you don't have to respond to conflict the way that you would if you were just merely in your natural fleshly self. You can respond differently. You don't have to, uh, you, are not, you are not stuck in what we talked about last week, escape responses or attack responses. Escape responses to conflict, your intention with somebody, they want something, you want something, there's a conflict of interest, 
and uh, the flesh kicks in, and an escape response doesn't really deal with the issue or try to <coughs> resolve the, reconcile the relationship. An escape response will tend to deny and whitewash the situation, and maybe even act like it's not even happening. Uh, an escape response flees the scene, doesn't deal with issues, just storms out of the room. Attack responses assault the person, verbally assault them, even physically assault them. Uh, attack responses bring in litigation. I'm going to sue you. Uh, attack responses don't try to reconcile the relationship. There's a different way to resolve conflict. There's a new creation kind of way to resolve conflict. And it's called peacemaking. Peacemaking is God's way of resolving conflict. And uh, it doesn't run from conflict in, in, in order to, uh, to escape the relationship. It doesn't attack the person to try to remove them as an obstacle. Uh, peacemaking tries to actually reconcile the relationship. The new creation way of resolving conflict is peacemaking. And we talked last week about four steps to peacemaking. And, um, oh yeah, I had overheads, but um, we can't find the link. So imagine in your head that there are, there's a, up at the top, Four steps to peacemaking. Step one says, glorify God. Yes, glorify God. That's the first step to peacemaking. We talked about that last week. Um, the first step in peacemaking is glorify God. You, you want to, uh, you're, you're in conflict and you don't have this tendency, but as a new creation, you have to discipline yourself to say, I gotta be aware of God right now. How can I please and honor God in the midst of this situation? As an, the flesh isn't wanting to do this, but as an act of discipline, you're telling yourself, I have got to bring God into this situation. I have got to be cognizant of the fact that I am a new creation and He is my Lord. And how do I please and honor God in this situation? The first step of peacemaking is, is glorify God. Uh, one way to glorify God in the midst of a conflict is to Overlook the sin. Remember we talked about that last week? You can overlook it. Just let it go. Let it roll off your shoulders. I'm not talking about like pretending like it's not really there. I'm saying, can you genuinely just let it go? Somebody took the, the last piece of birthday cake <coughs> in the fridge. It was carrot cake. It was for your birthday. Somebody ate it. Can you just let it go? Can you just overlook it? Um, hopefully, hopefully there are many times where you can glorify God in the midst of conflict by simply overlooking the offense. Doesn't mean it wasn't an offense, just means it's not worth making a big deal out of it. Now, there are times, however, when you have to deal with an issue. You have to... Uh, you can't overlook it. It's too damaging to overlook it. And that's what we want to talk about today. Steps two and three in the process. So, four steps to peacemaking. Step one, glorify God. Glorify God. Step two, take the, log out. take the log out or get the log out of your eye. Step three, gently restore the other. And step four, go and be reconciled. We'll look at step four next week. We're looking at two things today. One, get the log out of your eye. And number two, gently restore others. Let's start with getting the log out of your eye. And if you've got your Bible still open, or if you don't, let's open them up to Matthew chapter 7. When it comes to peacemaking, I want to think, how do I honor God, number one? And number two, I need to get the log out of my own eye. Let's read Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. 3 to 5. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let, let, let me take that speck out of your eye. When there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite, first 
take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Okay, we got two guys. Lumberjack Mac and Sawdust Sam. Okay, And Lumberjack Mac has a big old piece of timber in his face. You know, a log. Jesus is is uh, exaggerating the image so that you get so that you get the picture. He's got a really bad problem. He's got a log in his eye. Uh, Sada Sam also has a problem. He's got something in in his eye. Uh, both of these men have issues. They've got something in their eye. Now, uh, can you think of the last time you had something in your eyeball that wasn't a contact? Uh, I mean, I was doing, you know, I'm doing work on the deck all, all this past summer, and, um, you know, I'm sawing and hammering, and, and there were times where I got, uh, I got things in my eye, and when I get something in my eye, I have one objective in life, and it is to get it out, because there, it, it's, this is not right. It's not good to have things in your eyeballs. Uh, if, if an eyelash is off course, and gets in there, it's like, stop whatever we're doing. I, I gotta, I, I gotta, you know, stop the sermon. I gotta, I gotta get this out, right? Um, now, here's the thing. Both of these guys have something in their eye. Both of them need help, right? Um, Lumberjack Mac does not know that he has something in his eye. He has a serious issue. He's got a log in his eye, and he's got another serious issue. He does not know. Verse 3, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Is this really the case? You didn't notice that? (laughs) This is a serious issue. This is how... This is how blind you can be to your own issues. You could have timber in your face and you don't know it. Right? That's the picture that Jesus is giving us here. And Mac can see that Sam has an issue. Mac can see that he's got some, a speck of dust in his eye. And rather than being eager or even aware of getting his own problem under control, he's focused on dealing with somebody else's issue. It's really interesting here because Jesus doesn't say there's never a time for a guy like Lumberjack Mac to help out a guy like Sawdust Sam. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says, first, deal with yourself. Then, you'll be able to see so that you can help him. You see, Lumberjack Mac can actually help at some point, but not first. I would circle that word first in my Bible if I were you. First, you have to take the log out of your own eye. When conflict is happening, we have a uh, anti-peace tendency. And uh, you've got it, and I've got it, and it is a tendency to focus on the faults of others <laughs> in the midst of conflict. It is an anti-peace tendency. And the fact is, other people have problems. But like Lumberjack Mac, we have this incredible ability to not even be aware that we have problems in the midst of conflict. And because of that, even if we are correctly detecting that somebody else has got a speck of dust in their eye, our ability to clearly see how to help them out is hindered. And what Jesus is saying is, don't even try unless you have dealt with yourself when? First. Don't even try. You guys, very few of us have developed, and I'm not saying, I'm not picking on Choice City. (laughs) 
I'm saying as a race, as a, as a human species, very few of us have developed the, ten- the discipline of prioritizing our own mess, prioritizing our own hearts first. And, and in fact, I would even say, if you have never had some sort of kind of epiphany season in your life where you have just been so broken and you've realized that you have got some serious issues and you realize that like I have got to own my stuff first, you probably don't have this discipline in your life. Because your natural tendency is not to be this way. Your natural tendency is not to own your own issues first. You have to have something happen in your life where you have to make it a priority. You have to train yourself how to say, whoa, 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 wait, before I do this, I gotta deal with this first. And unless you've had a season in your life that has taught you how to do it, you probably don't do it. You probably tend to focus on other people first. Just like we don't have a tendency to have God awareness in conflict, we don't have a very good tendency to have self awareness. You see what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? It's not a, a reflex. It's not a social reflex. Uh, it, has to be, it has to be trained. Which means you have to be broken by your sin to develop it. We tend to focus on the sins of others. But let's just say, for the sake of argument... Um, Let's just take a conflict. Go back in your mind to your most recent conflict. Some of you are like, that's easy. Uh, See if you can think of it. If not, this, this will still work. Let's say that in that conflict, um, you were 2% responsible for it. That's all. That's very rare when that's the case. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, you're only 2% responsible for it. Um, how much of that 2% is your failure? Answer? All of it. You are 100% responsible for your 2%. That's nobody else's issue. That's nobody else's fault. That goes on you. You are to blame. It is your sin. It is your issue. You must own it. And when it comes to peacemaking, you have to truly own and deal with your very genuine 2% before you try to deal with their 98%. See what I'm saying? Your sin is your mess. Nobody else can make you sin. You're accountable before God. You're responsible before God for what's in your heart and what comes out of your life. Even if you were in a pressurized situation, your sin is your sin. And even if you're only 2% of the issue, you're 100% responsible for your 2%. And you've got to own it. If you want to be a peacemaker, you've got to own it. And hasn't the gospel taught us how to do this? Has not the gospel taught us how to own our brokenness and our failure? Think about this. There, the, the, the cross of Jesus Christ is the greatest display of the love of God that has ever been portrayed in all of human history. It's the greatest display of love that you will ever see. It speaks very highly of God's compassionate love for you. But you know what else the cross is? The cross is the greatest criticism you have ever received. Jesus died on that cross for you. And when I say for you, or for me, and when I say for me, what I mean by that is that he died on that cross in my place because the cross is what I deserve. You look at the cross and you have a picture of what your sin merits, of what it has earned, of what you deserve. It is an incredible 
criticism of your sin and of my sin. Now, what's amazing and beautiful about it is Jesus says, you deserved it, but I took it for you. I love you. But everyone who's come to that cross and has really embraced Jesus, you know what they've had to do? They've had to own it. We've had to confess our sins. We have to acknowledge that we have all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who in this room believes that about themselves? See, the cross already did the hard work. Somebody says, so, somebody's like, you're, but this 2%, it's you, you've got to own that. You're like, you got no idea. You have no idea my failures. That 2%, that's easy. If I'm, if I'm aware of God, and if I'm aware of the reality of myself, I own that 2%. And if you won't own it, you can just plan on war. You can just plan on doing damage. Just count on it. But if you will own it, if you will learn how to first take the log out of your own eye, great things happen. The opportunity for peace opens up. So what does it look like to take the log out of your own eye? Here's what we're talking about. I think in a nutshell, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about the confession of sin. At least that's how it kind of manifests itself uh, externally. We're talking about owning, identifying, owning your own sin in (coughs) conflict and confessing it. Making it public. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Have you ever experienced the marvelous things that happen in conflict when you confess your sins? I mean, countless times, countless times, in my marriage, and even with my children, I own my sin, I confess my sin, and wonderful things happen. What, actually, let me just ask you if you have intuitive awareness of what, what can maybe even oftentimes happen. There's no promise of this. But what often happens when you confess your own sins? What, are the, what is the other person? Same thing. Same thing. It just starts breaking down walls. It just starts breaking down walls. When I man up in my home and I own my sin, even if it's 2%, what happens? Reconciliation starts happening. Most of the time. Not always. Most of the time. And, and I do mean, when I say man up, I do mean, guys, I think you ought to lead the way in your family at confessing sin. In our home... The pattern, the vast majority of the time, is that I lead the way in bringing resolution to conflict because I own my sin first. It's very manly to do that, even if it's only 2% of the problem. I'm 100% responsible for it. So guys, own it. Pursue peace. Ladies, if they don't, do it. Don't be like, you're the man, you're supposed to be leading confession. No, no, no. You deal with yours first. And I'm kind of pulling the guys aside and being like, let's let's lead the way in this. Ladies, you didn't hear that. Okay? You you own it too. And if it's not happening, you pursue it. You don't wait for somebody else to pursue it. You hear what I'm saying? I'm trying to like shepherd the guys and I'm trying not to create (laughs) space for others to not own their sin. Um, let me talk about healthy confession. I've got four or five things here that just are some, some, um, well, here's what healthy confession looks like. One, avoid using words like if or but or maybe, like, you know, if, if maybe I hurt you, then I'm sorry. 
It's like, okay, well, just in case you did, maybe I forgive you. Uh, not if, maybe, but avoid, avoid that kind of, that's like a non-confession. There's no ownership in that. Um, admit specifically. Admit specifically. Identify the sin you've committed, articulate it by name, and express your own distaste for it. Hey, would you please forgive me for getting angry and for yelling? I should never talk to you that way. It's terrible. Please forgive me. I was like, I felt, I was feeling hateful, and there's no excuse for that. It's very specific. Own it, right? And, you, and I don't like it. I did that, and, I'm, and that's not okay. Um, acknowledge the hurt. You did damage, right? Your 2% did damage. Acknowledge the hurt. Uh, accept the consequences. I realize that I broke your trust. And I realize it's going to take some time to earn that back. And then ask forgiveness. Sorry about that. Is not the confession of sin. That's like, too bad it happened. Hey, honey, too bad that happened with us. Sorry about it. Not that sorry is a bad word. It's just very... The flesh loves sorry because it doesn't like pin you down. You don't have to own anything. If you were to say, I am so sorry that I got so angry and I yelled and I brought incredible lack of peace to our home, I should never do that. I am sorry. I feel sorrow for it. Will you please forgive me? Is total ownership. I am in debt. I'm asking you to release me from the debt. Will you please forgive me? That's a true confession. And it opens doors for peace. It opens incredible doors for peace. And sometimes you get your own heart right, you confess, the other person confesses, reconciliation ensues, and, um, and sometimes um, it doesn't. Sometimes uh, more has to be said. Sometimes, uh, sometimes a person needs help getting the speck out of their eye still. Um, and, and so that brings us to our, our, next, our, our next step in the <coughs> four steps of peacemaking. Four steps of peacemaking. Number one, glorify God. Glorify God. Number two, get the, get the log out of your eye. Number three, gently restore. Gently restore. You've brought God into the situation. You're like, God, I want to honor you. I want to be a new creation kind of man in this conflict. My flesh is rising up, but I, I don't want to live according to the flesh. I want to live by the power of your spirit. I want to live like a new creation. How can I honor and please you? And then you get, you get yourself right. You get your own heart right. Please forgive me. I'm, I'm starting to get angry. I, I, I'm feeling bitter. I'm, Lord, forgive me. I, for, I forget sometimes that I'm a sinner in need of grace. And maybe you even say to the person, will you please forgive me? And, and, and now you're asking the question, is there anything now that I can do to help them own their part of this problem, own their contribution to the situation? Because the Bible actually teaches that there are times when we have to speak to others about their sin. There are times when you can't overlook the sin. You actually have to talk to people about their sin. And that's kind of hard for people sometimes because what comes to mind for a lot of people is like, well, what about the, like, the do not judge issue in the Bible? Right? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're not supposed to judge people. How you, I'm not going to go talk to people about their sin because Jesus says don't judge. And frankly, I don't want to because it's really uncomfortable to have that kind of conversation. Anyway, so... Um, well, let's look at it. In fact, Matthew 7, same passage. You know the whole get the log out of your eye? Just two verses earlier is the great do not judge passage. So let's read it. Matthew chapter 
7, verse 3. Did I say 5? Matthew 7, verse 3. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Verse 1. Judge not. And most people stop right there. (laughs) Judge not that you be not judged. Oh, maybe they stop there. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Well, I don't want to get in trouble with that. I'm going to go around doing stuff that's going to come back and and haunt me. So, no judging. There is a type of judgment that Jesus clearly forbids here. Now, the question is, what is that judgment? In fact, if you jump down to verse, what is it? Six? Somebody read verse 6. Read it out loud. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Okay. So you're going to have to determine who are the dogs and pigs in your life. That's just like four verses later. Do not judge. Don't give your pearls to pigs. You're going to have to make an assessment, whatever that verse means. You're going to have to make an assessment of some sort. So when Jesus says, do not judge, he's not forbidding all assessments of all people whatsoever. That's not what he's forbidding. He's forbidding a certain kind of judgment. What kind of judgment does Jesus forbid? Look at verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. There it is. You're a hypocrite. That's the kind of judgment that Jesus forbids. Here you are whining and complaining about all the people who are whining and complaining about the election. Hypocrite. Sorry. That's what Jesus, that kind of judgment is the kind of criticism that you're giving to other people blind to the fact that you suffer from the very same illness. Be careful. But it doesn't mean you never speak up when you see that something is wrong. You just need to make sure that your heart is right. Because um, people need help seeing They do. They need help seeing. Amy and I were driving down the road the other day on Mulberry right over here. And here's this dude. And he's driving in his convertible. It's like an old classic car. It's like, you know, one of these November days. It's probably 75 degrees out. It's just absolutely beautiful. Fort Collins day. He's driving his old classic car down the road. The top is down. And he's dragging a car cover behind him. And you could just imagine what happened. He, it's, out in the, it's out in the front yard, right? He pulls the cover back. He's like, well, yeah, I'm going to take this thing for a cruise. I'm going to go drag Mulberry. And, uh, and the cover gets stuck on the bumper. He just drives out. It's like, oh, yeah, it's just so cool. No, it's not so cool. You have to... <laughs> Actually, it was, it, it was like the sweet old man. You know, it's just like, it wasn't one of those deals. But he needed help, right? And it doesn't have to be ugly. It doesn't have to be a mean confrontation. Excuse me, sir. Hey, your car car cover's dragging behind you. So he hops out of the car, in the intersection, goes around, gets a car cover. He just needed help seeing. People need help seeing because things are happening in their lives that they don't realize are happening. God gives us one another so that we can help each other see after you get the <coughs> log out of your own eye. Then you will be able to see and get the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Uh, this actually, this confrontation stuff is some of the hardest stuff 
I've ever had to do in my life. If you've ever done anything like it, I'm sure you can relate. It's really hard to go and humbly talk with somebody about uh, some issue, right? This is hard. This is the hard, hard stuff of life. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, this is really good. He says, nothing is so cruel. Nothing is so cruel as the tenderness that consigns another to his sin. You're a tender person who doesn't want to make waves, but you're just leaving people in their sin. You're saying nothing, nothing to them. He goes on to say, nothing can be more compassionate than the severe rebuke that calls a brother back from the path of sin. It's a compassionate, loving thing to do in the right situation. People need help getting the speck out of their eyes. So when do you do that? When do you decide, okay, I'm not going to overlook this. We've got to actually deal with this. It's something that needs to be pursued. When do you say something? There are four times, at least, when it's, I think it's pretty clear you need to say something. The first one is when people are damaging their own lives. People are damaging their own lives. Galatians 6 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual meaning those of you who are walking by the Spirit, Paul has just talked about living a Spirit-filled life in Galatians chapter 5. Well, here he says, those Spirit-filled people should restore this person who's caught in transgression in a spirit of gentleness. If you see somebody who's caught in transgression, restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Go in a gentle way and help them see, hey, you're caught. been caught up by something. Listen to the way James talks about it. James 5.20. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So here's a guy who's wandering. He needs help. Somebody's got to say something. He's in self-destruct mode. He doesn't even know it probably. And if he does, he doesn't have anybody around him trying to like remind him of what's true and what's better. He needs help. Something has to be said. You need to say something when you think people are damaging their own lives. Don't just stand silent as they self-destruct. You have to actually have that conversation where you say, hey, can I share something with you that I'm concerned about? I remember a time when Uh, Amy and I sat down with a couple here in Fort Collins. This was probably 15 years ago. We sat down with them because Amy had had a very difficult conversation with her, and I had had a difficult conversation with her because she was not married to the guy that she was living with, and she was claiming to be a believer, and he was claiming not to be a believer. So they were living together, they were sleeping together, and we were saying, hey, sister, There are implications for your life of following the Lord Jesus Christ. So then she told him, and then he wanted to meet us. Oh, no. I do not want to have this meeting, this this conflict, right? So we sat down with him and with her together, and we talked with them about what it means to be a Christian, what it means for Jesus to be Lord and King of your life, that it has implications for your marriage life, it has implications for your sex life, it has implications for the way that you're living. You see, because a person who's following Jesus is following this King and going down this path, and a person who's not living under the reign of Jesus is living under their own reign. And so, you see, guys, you're going two different paths. So they went away from that conversation and a few months later he was baptized and a few months later he was getting married to her. And guess who stood as the best man? Sometimes people are self-destructive and they don't know it. And somebody's got to say something. What might God do? through your life if you would be that person after you get the log out. (laughs) 
That's one instance. That's one kind of instance where you've got to say something. Another kind of instance where you've got to say something is when you think that there's been damage to your own relationship. Like your relationship with them is not right. Matthew 18, 15 says, if your brother sins against you, so he sins against you, you've got to go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Uh, sometimes sins can't be overlooked. You actually have to go and talk about things and say, hey, can I share something with you that has been hurtful to me? In gentleness, get the log out. Your heart's right. Can I share something with you that's been hurtful to me? Sometimes you don't even know what's going on. You just sense that there's tension in the relationship. And Jesus says you need to go then also. Listen to Matthew 5, 23. If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer you your gift. Now you might think, well, that's their responsibility. They've got something against me. Jesus says, no. If you see it, do you sense that something's wrong? Even if you're not sure what it is, you need to go get reconciled to that person. Because you're sensing that there's damage to the relationship. You can't overlook that because you can feel the tension. You can cut it with a knife. It's so thick. That's a second instance when you need to actually say something. A third instance when you need to actually say something is when you can tell that it's damaging other people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says that, um, well, there's a situation in the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5. Paul addresses it. Here's the deal. There's a guy who's sleeping with his stepmom. I mean, it's just super jacked up. I don't know if you guys have ever read the book of 1 Corinthians at the background. That church was, should have been blown up. I mean, it, it was blown up. It was blown up from the inside. And that's why Paul had to, to um, uh, address them so sternly. And, and, and yet Jesus loved them. Right? So, hey, if Jesus can love the church in Corinth, Jesus can love uh, a lot. Uh, they were a mess. Well, so this guy's sleeping with his stepmom. And Paul says, okay... And nobody's doing anything about it. That's the other thing. No, this is happening. Nobody's doing anything about it. And Paul says, okay, guys, hey, wait. A little leaven leavens the whole loaf. You know how leaven works. You put it in a little piece of dough, and it like basically infects the whole thing. Paul says, you've got to deal with this. You've gotta do it. You can't overlook that kind of thing. You've got to deal with it. Um, so you've got to deal with stuff when... People are self-destructing. You've got to deal with stuff when there's damage between your relationship. You've got to deal with stuff. You've got to say something when people are doing damage to a bunch of other people. And you've got to say something when somebody's doing something that's just significantly dishonoring God. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul has to confront Peter. Because Peter's doing some things that are indicating lies about the gospel. And so Paul says... To, Paul actually has to, he like publicly rebukes him. It's kind of a messy situation as well. <laughs> hey, we're in good, we're, we're in good company. We're, we're, uh, if we're messy, don't worry. The Bible's full of messy people. Um, so something had to be said, though. Paul says, if righteousness were through the law, which is what Peter's indicating with his actions, then Christ died for no purpose, Peter. That's a, that significantly dishonors Jesus. If what you're doing is implying that there was no purpose for his death. So Paul has to move on. Paul has to say something. Okay, so you got to say something when <coughs> there is uh, self-destruction happening. You gotta say something when there's ten, there's a brokenness in your relationship between each other. You gotta say something when it's damaging other people, and you gotta say something when something's significantly dishonoring God. So, um, how do you do it? Meaning, what's the conversation supposed to look like? I just want to get real practical. I don't typically preach this way, um, but I we got I want you to have some real practical uh, steps to. to reconciling relationships. Um, what do you do? Well, first of all, just make sure you're prepared. Make sure you're prepared. Make sure you pray and that your heart is ready. You're, you've dealt with your own mess. You're going gently. You're feeling love for the person. 
You need to pray and think through the situation. Think through what you're going to say. Have some idea of where you're headed, what, what needs to be said. If you have to, you may sometimes need to get counsel from other people so that you know how to have this kind of conversation. Now, watch out for gossip when you do that. That can turn into, that if, you're, if you're going to talk to somebody about some other situation and your purpose is not to get help so that you can go talk to them, don't do it because then you're just gossiping. <laughs> if you need help thinking through it and you intend to go work things out, then get some counsel. But don't just go talking about this person over here just to like get it off your chest. That's called gossip. It's sinful, it's bad, let's not do it. Okay, so be prepared. You've got to prepare your mind, prepare your heart. And then Matthew 18, verse 15 says you go one-on-one -on -one in private and you talk to this person. And when you talk to this person, here are three things I want you to keep in mind. One, you have to actually share your observations. And you have to do it as a peacemaker. Which means, don't, be in, don't use escape responses and don't use attack responses in this conversation. Don't whitewash the situation. Don't be a people pleaser in the situation. You've got to speak the truth. And you've got to do it in love. Don't be an attacker. You've got to do it in love. Ephesians 4.15. 4, uh, speak the truth in love. And you just honestly share your perception of what's going on. Be careful of declaring that you have perfect God's eye vision and that you're certain and that you've got everything figured out. Just give your honest perception of what's going on. Um, affirm your love for them. Listen to their response. Try to provide biblical counsel. Share your observations. That's the first thing you do. Then the second thing you do is you need to give them some space to process it. You don't have to force them to like understand everything right now. You're not the Holy Spirit, right? Do not play the Holy Spirit. You don't have to make a watertight case. You don't have to nail them down with every single possible thing that you could bring into the situation. You, your job is to lovingly share and then you trust God with the results. Listen to this, 2 Timothy 2.24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Okay, that's your job. You be calm, you endure evil, you correct with gentleness. And then it says, God may perhaps grant them repentance. What's your job? Share. What's God's job? Change them. And you can't do God's job. And God gave you a job to do. Gently restore. Share your perceptions. Then give them space and then have some sort of follow-up conversation. So you've got to prepare and then you've got to go one-on-one -on -one in private. You have this kind of conversation. If necessary, there are situations where where you have to bring actually more, more people into the process if, if things continue to progress and somebody's living clearly in sin and they won't repent. And, you know, Matthew 18 kind of gets a process for bringing more people into the situation for better, clearer communication and more accountability. Um, but that's a different sermon, really. All right, so we've seen now three steps to peacemaking, right? Glorify God. Get the log out. Oh, <laughs> nice work, dude. Uh, gently restore. That's what we've seen. Next week, we're, there's one more step. We'll look at that uh, next week. Um, this, is, this is hard stuff, right? I, I suspect in the room, there is a sense that, like, I know this is good. And I suspect there is also, uh, ow, this hurts, right? Um, we're, I, I told you at the very beginning, this is heart surgery stuff, right? This stuff hurts, it's hard, it requires you to look at your own 
mess that you've made, perhaps bad patterns in your own life, a tendency not to go Godward, a tendency to not have good self-awareness, a tendency to rip people to shreds or run away from them. We've all, we, we've, this is hard stuff and we've all done it poorly. So, good news. You can start again. <laughs> the gospel says you can start again. Christian, you're a new creation. You do not have to keep living according to the power of the flesh. You can walk by the Spirit. God will help you with this. There's a lot of things that we have left to learn, all of us. But the gospel says, um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so you can start fresh.